is then lowered by that amount for the next fiscal year. So thanks to some good insider information, last week, just before Canatech Cape Town, Fields of Green for All put a submission, a submission into the Appropriations Committee to say that, that those excess budgets should be used for cannabis development. Because if you look at the demographic of Parliament, there are 22 different government departments who are involved with this. There's 22 government departments who need to be paying attention to the development of our cannabis industry in South Africa. Now we know that there's quite a few organizations around here who have been, who are purporting to speak to government. But I don't know how we can all get to all of them at once. So I flew down to, back down to Cape Town yesterday and I spoke in front of this committee. So I'm going to cut the rest of the presentation a little bit short because I think it's very important for people to know what went down yesterday. Now in this space, one of the major aims of the expo is to reduce the stigma associated with cannabis. We all live in this weed world where it doesn't seem like there's much of a stigma. If you were sitting in that parliamentary committee meeting yesterday, you will know that the stigma is alive and well. And I can tell you, that those honourable members know nothing. So it's almost as if our job is just starting. I was busy giving my presentation and the honourable member from the DA interrupted me and said, you are responsible for the lawlessness in this country. The chairman stopped me and he said, just hang on a minute. And he pointed at the Honourable Member from the DA and he said, you are out of order. Ms. Clark has come here all the way from Johannesburg as a representative of civil society. This is a public hearing, so you need to listen. It's important that you listen. So we've got a long way to go. But I must say that it wasn't all bad news. By the time I got back to the airport, I already had two emails in my inbox from members saying we would like to know more. The secretary of the committee requested that I send the soft copy of our document through, through to the committee so that it could be distributed. So the day ended on a, on a rather high note and uh, at least we know now that we've kind of poked the beast a little bit. We've poked it a little bit, we've got to keep on doing that. So if anybody hears of anything going on in Parliament to do with finance, to do with development, doesn't necessarily have to do with cannabis, please let us know, Fields of Green, so we can keep poking the beast. Now this particular field of cannabis was also my first slide yesterday. And you know, it's amazing the reaction that this photograph gets. They almost gasped. And I said to them, what about this cannabis? It's never been planted. It's used mainly for livestock. What about it? Are you going to go count those plants? Because there was a leaked bill earlier this year that said we might only be allowed to have 15 plants each. Who's going to come count my plants? Who's going to count these plants? So the shaping of the regulations and the way forward is really, really important. It affects every single one of us. So when Julian and I were arrested, we had these three choices. And now we're beginning to think to ourselves, this is such a hell of a job. Nine years on and we still haven't got a new law. Maybe we should have admitted our guilt. Maybe we should have paid a bribe. It certainly would have been much cheaper to pay a bribe after the millions and millions that we've spent over the last nine years. But to change the law was our only option. Because this is really about human rights. And yesterday in Parliament, there was the United Nations Children's Fund, there was Kasatu and Alta. And you know, every single one of those people that spoke, there's something that cannabis could have done for their cause. If you think about the um, the Rural Health Project, 
Imagine cannabis being primary health care in the rural areas. So we need to team up with the Rural Health Project, who obviously don't know anything about cannabis. They obviously, they almost blanked me after the, after the meeting. We really need these foundations of human rights. We need the foundations of the sovereignty of our own bodies and the sovereignty of our own minds. Let's make sure that the next thing that comes out of courts or out of parliament, let's make sure that this word cognitive liberty is included, the sovereignty of our minds. So we've been fighting and fighting and fighting for DACA and as most people know, we now have this. But it means very little. Being able to grow a little bit of weed, being able to smoke weed in your own home, being able to keep some of your own stock. It means very little for 90% of South Africans who don't have a scoop, who don't have privacy, who don't have security for their crops. So we have to keep on bashing on and bashing on so that we can get fields of green for all South Africans. All of these events are certainly lowering the stigma, but I challenge you today, every single time you go to one of these events, it must empower you to go and speak to the naysayers, go and speak to those people who are against us. We are tired of preaching to the choir. And that particular honourable member from the DA, he's alive and well and doing the worst possible jo job for drug policy in South Africa. Those are the people we need to bring to the forefront so that we can educate them about the truth about Dhaka. All of these events, events are all well and good, but are we really getting rid of the stigma? Is there really conversations going on behind closed doors? I seem to think there are. I seem to think that there's a lot of people with a lot of money going in the back door and capturing our weed. So we've got to be really, really careful. Nothing about us without us. So you will know of Fields of Green for All has been around for nine years and we brought out these publications. We are the only non-profit company in the room. And I've been watching in our stall and some people are a bit taken aback that we're charging a hundred grand for our booklet. The money for the printing of the booklet had to come from somewhere. So please, your hundred grand will go into the printing and the distribution of the final copy of the book because this is just a draft out for public, public comment. But it's the final draft. And this is your opportunity to have your say. So please support us over at our store. And then on a slightly light, lighter note on the right hand side, the Dhaka private clubs are something that Fields of Green for All is really pushing. Because this is the one model that has to endure after legalization. We've already got our privacy. Thank you Judge Zongo and the Constitutional Court. They can never, ever take the privacy judgment away from us. And the thing with the Dhaka Private Club is that the only way it's not going to work is if you don't have enough friends. So if you've got enough friends, this is the best model to use to create a closed loop system with private members. And the best advantage of a DAPA private club is it's going to keep cannabis culture alive in South Africa. And that is the most beautiful thing about what we do, is we love the members of the cannabis culture in South Africa, and we want to keep that amazing, vibrant community alive. But it's all very well talking about regulations, but we have to lay down a foundation of really good principles. As I was saying, who's going to come? Who's going to come and count my plants? Is, are the cops going to come count my plants? No, we need proportionality because there's nobody who comes and counts my whiskey. Alcohol is more harmful than cannabis, so we need these laws to be proportional. We need a degree of certainty because at the moment it's a mess with all the grey areas. 
We need to look to the future and plan for it so we don't have to do this again. We certainly need these laws to be durable over time and this is something, transparency and accountability, that is a rare and beautiful thing in South Africa. If we get transparency and accountability, then we will hopefully get capable regulators. And capable regulators who actually use the plant. Don't be just be regulators because you're some bureaucrat in the government. So, once we've got our capable regulators, then we can make laws that are relevant to the South African context. This is our latest diagram that we always want to come up with some new ways of explaining what we're doing. Our aim in poking the government and getting rid of the stigma and bringing out our regulations documents, our aim is for fair regulations. Regulations that are based on evidence. Now we believe that there are not any evidence-based cannabis regulations anywhere in the world. Let South Africa be first. Then, if we, are, if we get our fair regulations, those fair regulations are going to cover both aspects of the cannabis economy in South Africa. On the left hand side we have what is called legacy cannabis. So that is all of us who have been operating, growing, trading, using under prohibition. Small scale craft and rural uh, growers, traders, users. And on the right hand side, inevitably, especially at an event like this, we have our commercial cannabis. These two areas of the cannabis industry need to work together and they need to work together consciously. So, you have your fair regulations overshadowing both sides of the cannabis industry. They are underpinned by this consciousness. But, we don't live in a perfect world. We certainly don't live in a perfect world. So if you look at the two black squares on either side, you will see that those who operate outside of, of the fair regulations and outside of conscious cannabis industry, that is what is commonly known as the black market. That could also be people who are just uninformed and they don't know any better, or it could be those people with criminal intent. And then those people that op uh, operate outside the commercial cannabis industry those are your unscrupulous companies, those that are busy going through the back door and talking to the government with all their money, or those that we call the pump and dumpers. Because I can tell you we've spoken at about seven different cannabis conferences in the last three months, and we have heard the most ridiculous figures about what African cannabis is going to look like. These people come in, they write reports about our industry, they've got lots of money, they circulate these reports which are mostly bullshit, and then they use those reports to pump their share price. And then the minute that their share price goes up, they sell them it all. So pump and dust, pump and dust. It's alive and well in the cannabis industry all over the world. So unless we have fair regulations, Unless we have conscious cannabis, those two black squares on the other side are going to encroach on our human rights, on our cognitive liberty, and on our sovereignty. So now just getting back to these pump and dumpers who seem to know everything about our South African cannabis industry, the reality is quite simple. If you look on the left hand side, that is a pyramid of regulations. And on the right hand side is a pyramid of human beings, us, people. The pyramid of regulations show you how the regulations need to be distributed over the different sectors of our cannabis economy. The most regulations, the big purple area at the bottom, goes to medical, goes to a pharmaceutical product that has a barcode and that makes a specific medicinal claim. But if you look at the purple one on the human side, 
in South Africa, that is the least amount of humans who are going to be buying the pharma product. Now, when an Indian report company comes to South Africa and tells us that we have 1.4 million cannabis users in South Africa, it's maybe 1.4 million pharmaceutical product users. It's certainly not all of us. Then moving up that uh, pyramid, you will see that the next amount of regulations is for what we call standard and wellness. So your normal user, your normal trader, your normal cultivator. That is less regulations than your pharmaceutical product. And on the human side, that's the most amount of humans. So that is where we need to concentrate our fair regulations on standard and wellness. Get off of your obsession with licenses and a pharmaceutical product. There's a place for it, but it is very small because the regulations are huge and the humans are small. Then when you move even further up the, up the line, you see our lack of private clubs with even less regulations and an average amount of humans. And right at the top we have home cultivation, CBD and hemp. We don't want to be over-regulated when it comes to home cultivation, CBD and hemp. And there we have an average amount of humans who will be involved in that particular side of the, of the demograph of our regulations. So if you are kind enough and generous enough to buy one of our books at our school, you will see this diagram. Just contemplate it. Because although I can't give you the numbers yet, this is what it looks like in terms of a graphic representation. And this is what our cannabis industry looks like. We've got our full platforms, which are responsible adult use, industrial cannabis, health uses, and traditional, cultural, and religious uses. We've been beating that drum for nine years. Everybody knows about our four platforms. Those four platforms have got different ways of cultivating the plant, we estimate that there are 900,000 cannabis farmers in South Africa. We estimate that there are 20 million users of cannabis in South Africa. But probably the most important line on this diagram is the one at the bottom. And it says, the success of a country's drug policy is directly proportional to the size of its black market. So if we don't get the regulations right, our drug policy is not going to succeed because all of us ordinary criminals are just going to carry on doing what we've been doing for the last 700 years and stuff the regulations. So we need to get it right. What about this guy? I'm sure you've heard us say this before, but unless it is legal for the guy who sells the matchbox at the taxi rank to keep putting food on the table by selling his little bit of insango in a matchbox, then it is not legal. The size of what we call our carcinomics model is enormous. It's worth 46 billion rand every year in South Africa. And at the Canatech conference in Cape Town last weekend, nobody knows about the carcinomics. Nobody knows about the guy who sells the matchbox at the taxi rank. So let's let the world know about it because we're proud of our informal market and we want to include the informal economy within our legal cannabis framework. As you know, we like to cover everything when it comes to cannabis, so we also spend at least once or twice a year we go and visit the United Nations in Vienna to represent South Africa and join up with uh, the Civil Society Task Force, which is a, um, a group that we belong to for the last seven years. And this is where we learn a lot about how to formulate drug policy. And through our collaboration with the European activists, we've come out with this particular publication, which shows you that out of the 26 
Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17 that cannabis can help with to realize those sustainable development goals. But how do we do this? It's all very well saying that this is what we want, but what does it actually look like? And it's really simple. You have your cultivators, your growers, and your farmers. They feed into what we call a hub. It can also be, but it's not exactly the same as a co-op. Or it can also be, but it's not exactly the same as a stock fund. Now, last Wednesday, we spoke to a group of 400 farmers in Burville, in the Drakensburg. And this whole idea of a hub and a co-op is part of agricultural language in our country already. And it's, this diagram is to show you that what we've got in the underground cannabis market is all that we need. We need to just take the existing cannabis economy out of the dark, lift it up into the light, and formalize it. We do not need to reinvent the wheel. If you put the current cannabis economy on one side and the model that we are proposing on the other side, you will see that they fit really well together. But you'll have to read the book to understand exactly how they, how they fit. Who wants a license to grow cannabis? Why? Why? You want to get into your bed with the government, that's fine. You want to grow weed with a hazmat suit and a hairnet, that's fine. I look very silly in a hairnet. There's so much opportunity for you, your brand, your community, without having to go and give money to the people who have been oppressing us for so long. Let them get on with the pharma medicine. That's fine. There's a place for it but there's a much bigger space for all of us. Look what happened in the Sutu. The licenses start out, started out as 5,000, now they're 500,000. There was apparently 60 licenses, there's only two companies growing, and they may be employed 80 or 100 per Sutu people, bragging that they're the biggest employer in the Sutu. 5% of the population and the other 95% it's still illegal for them what about the farm in Stellenbosch woo woo all over 702 we've got a license the next day Sopra came out and said no they haven't got a license they're just on a short list pumping and dumping all over 702 saying we're the first in South Africa no you're not it's going to take a long time what about these guys? This is the waiting trial section at Polesmore Prison. What about these guys who've been in jail with no bail since February 2018? What about their five children that are sitting at home where their wives can't get jobs to feed the family because of the stigma of their husbands being in jail? This is the reality. That's why we say we're going to stop the cops. Because right now, that takes up most of our time at Fields of Green for All, because don't be under the illusion that the cops are not still busting people. Right now, we have one of our traditional healers who's in jail in the Northwest for 100 grams, arrested in her own home. It's not over yet, folk. We've got to remember the harms of prohibition and end the stigma, because it's the ignorance of the cops the ignorance of the law, the ignorance of the judgment, and the fact that they are still trying to get their cool drink money after all these years. They're not going to give up their cool drink money very easily. For the foreigners here, that means bribing. We call cool drink money is bribing. What about the people who are losing their jobs? Yesterday in Parliament, the one honourable member asked me you know how many jobs he believes that the Stellenbosch farm is going to employ 250 people. Now I'm sure they will employ 250 people. But every single month there's 250 people losing their jobs 
because they've got cannabis in their system. There's a Rastafara gentleman who uh, contacted us from the Northern Cape. You know that place and nobody ever goes up in the north there. He lost his job at the mine. He was a senior supervisor. But he uses the plant not before work. He's never intoxicated at work, but he uses the plant for his religious rights. He's lost his job. How's he going to feed his kids? How's he going to put food on the table? So they give jobs here and then they take away jobs there. It's not going to work. Let us read that a minute. For those of you that want a license, we're not allowed to pay our bills with cannabis, but now they want our tax money to pay their bills with cannabis. Doesn't make sense. It's not all about growing the weed. There are so many industries in South Africa that can really benefit from the explosion of this market. I can tell you now, ladies and gentlemen, there are enough people growing weed in South Africa. Let's get into the support system. Let's support this booming cannabis industry through your security company, your information quality control testing systems, safety systems. What about education? I see at Canatech in Cape Town, there was quite a few American companies doing training and education. We need South African companies to be all over the place because that's really going to help uh, to stop the stigma. What about paying attention to our environment? You know, with all of these facilities opening up and growing indoor, what about our ESCOM? We haven't got enough ESCOM. Are we going to give it away to foreign companies to come and grow weed under lights? Let's be careful about our environment. Let's be careful that this cannabis industry does not become toxic to our environment. Nobody in South Africa ever talks about being a caregiver. This is a very big thing that started in, in California particularly in the 1960s with people who would grow and provide cannabis for sick people. There's a huge market for caregivers in South Africa. Those of you who are angels, who are health professionals, what about becoming a cannabis caregiver? It really is an incredibly rewarding path to take. Research and development. Now, I know that we always hear that old thing, oh, more research needs to be done, and it actually is the most researched plant on the planet. But we don't have any, enough cannabis research in South Africa, and we have to uh, encourage our universities and our institutes of higher learning to be doing this research, particularly on African land race strains and medicine related to African land race strains that can be used in primary health care because everybody's beginning the people at the bottom of the run with no medical aid. We cannot ignore workers' rights within the cannabis economy. Yesterday in Parliament, one of the submissions before me was Kosatu. Now those guys can speak. The Congress of South African Trade Unions. And I managed to have a little whisper in the Kasachi guy's ear afterwards. And I said, dude, are you on board with weed? And he's like, so we're going to push right from the beginning. All of you opening up these fancy companies. You teach your workers right. We're watching you. Duffer Tourism. This is possibly one of the most exciting, colorful and fun areas to be in. We need Dhaka Tourism to feature in all of the big tourism expos that are always happening all over the place. And then one mustn't forget about our neighboring countries. Let's not forget poor Namibia. You know, we were in Namibia a few months ago and I could cry because they really are right at the beginning of everything. And they've got such a conservative government and such a conservative population. Let's support them. And Zimbabwe and Mozambique and Lesotho and Swaziland and Uganda and Ghana and Malawi. Let's get them all to the table so that we can get a pan-African regulatory system going. 
We're hoping to go to the African Union later next year and put forward our proposals because we can't be working against each other. Zimbabwe only has medical and we've got privacy. It doesn't make any sense. We're all the same. 20 million Zimbabweans in South Africa. There's lots of South Africans who go to Zimbabwe to see what's in it for them in the weed business. So let's all work together. This brings me almost to the end of my rant. And we always end our presentations with how you can help. Now, we have an exciting thing to announce at, at the expo today. Next year, we are going to launch the South African National Cannabis Survey. And this is where, particularly if you've got a cannabis brand, this is where you need, we need your help. We need to raise an awful lot of money in order to conduct the survey. But it's very, very important. Because of those Indian guys who came and told us that there's 1.4 million cannabis users in South Africa. I mean, what a load of nonsense. All the guys who come from Ireland, Prohibition Partners, they brought out the African Cannabis Report. And at least 95% of the inv in information there is the biggest load of rubbish. So we need our own South African survey particularly for regulations in Parliament, but also for the cannabis industry. Because if you have a cannabis business, you should be able to know what the market looks like. So it will help everybody. It will help us as activists, and it will certainly help us to get the economic advantages that will come with evidence-based regulation. So please visit our stall over there, you can pick up a flyer about the survey and we're also looking for companies to partner with us in the survey because every single company in this room has got a slightly different little demograph and we also need to include the prohibitionists we need to include the rehabs and the christians and the doctors for life all the people who are against us because if we don't include those people who are against us in the survey what will happen when we publish our results, they will come in and attack our methodology. So if we involve them right from the beginning in the formulation of the survey, we should get really, um, really accurate results. Do we always put this slide up just to underpin the fact that this is not all about medicine, it's not all about hemp and seeds and economy, it's also about the freedom of our minds. We need to come back to this fact all the time that what we are fighting for is our human right to put whatever we want into our bodies. And my name is Michael Clark and I would really like fields of green for all citizens of the whole world. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, up next on the main expert stage, we have Rasta Rika from Rasta Rika Village presenting on right. processing. I've got a good one of you there. Hello, Maxie.